2020 here at Queen Victoria Museum and Art Gallery. I'm David Maynard and with me is Catherine Pugh, the leader of the water team at City of Launceston. We're here to talk to you today about the Tamar, which is uh, considered to be a river, but we actually know it is an estuary. We're going to work through that topic. Uh, please remember that we'd love to have some of your questions online. We'll be uh, talking here for about half an hour and then uh, answering all your questions. So to get started, Catherine, uh, can you give us an idea of what the proper name would be for our estuary and uh, clear up what an estuary is? Sure. So the gazetted name for the system is the Kanamaluka River Tamar Estuary. Um, I tend to refer to it just as Kanamaluka Tamar Estuary. Um, estuaries are usually a semi-enclosed body of water that is open to the sea. Um, but also has the freshwater influence. So easy way to remember that is, is the place where the, the freshwater meets the sea. So what the biggest problem there is that uh, a river and an estuary function very differently. Did you want to talk about yeah. that? Yeah, they're, they're totally different. So um, when, we, when we call the Tamar River a river, we... In our minds, we imagine a system where the water flows in, in one direction. Rivers flow downhill and out to the sea. In an estuary, the, the, the water movement is in and out. We have the ebb and flow of the tide. So the, the river flows downstream, but then the tide pushes back up against it again. So there's a real push, push and pull effect in an estuary. And it completely changes the way the system works and it changes the way that we have to work with the system as well. All right, well, we might just have a look at our first slide there, which is an aerial photograph of uh, the estuary. And I'll just, I'll run my cursor up, it's a little bit unclear. You can see Launceston here, uh, the north and south esk feed uh, fresh water into the uh, head of the uh, tamer, and then it tracks all the way down through around 70 kilometres till you get to the heads there. Now, along that length, the salinity varies, particularly uh, depending on how much fresh water we've had coming in. And uh, the salinity is fairly, the gradient is fairly, uh, uh, what is it, uh, it changes continuously along its length. Whereas some other estuaries have what we call a salt water wedge, where salt water being denser than fresh will come in under fresh water and there's a clear differentiation between the two mm. uh, hot, uh, a hay line. And um, uh, so why is this system so well mixed? It's because it's so windy. It's because the sea floor uh, along the length is so variable. It, uh, it's zero at low tide in Launceston and at the mud flats. But down near uh, the pilot station at uh, low head, it's 53 metres deep. And it, and, and it changes through the full length of that. And then you've got the tide that you've mentioned coming in and out once, twice mm. a day. Mm. And each time that comes in, 300 million cubic metres of water come in. That's quite a lot of water. And it's trying to rush through some narrow gaps. So it's basically a washing machine, a big, long washing machine. Mm. But you have you know about the more about that tidal influence than I do, so I might just... Go to the next slide and you can yeah. talk about that one. Yeah, so Long Systems, um, or well, the estuary, the Tamar estuary has uh, what we call an asymmetrical tide. So at, um, when the tide is coming in, it comes in much more quickly when, than when the tide is going out. Mm -hmm. So the, the water trying to get downhill, down out into Bass Strait is, com is coming up against that water that's pushing back in from Bass Strait. And the water pushing back in is pushing back harder and faster. And so what tends to happen is that we get uh, nutrients and pollutants in modern day um, all get trapped up in that upper end of the estuary, um, up around sort of Launceston to Lagana Way. But it can't get out. We've also got here in, in the Tamar an interesting system where it is um, the tide amplifies up the estuary. So at low head, the tide is about two and a half metre range. But in Launceston, it's more like three and a half metres in range. And that's, again, due to the, the length of the estuary and the, the winding nature of it. Okay. So it's a really interesting system that we're having to uh, live along the length of. So 
in layman's terms, the incoming tide is stronger. Yep. And so it overrides the, the efforts to get water out of the yeah. system. Yep. And yep. and so that ends up uh, affecting things like uh, sediment loads. Yep. Just simply can't get out. It can't get out. No, that's right. So so a lot of pollutants and sediments get trapped in that upper estuary, um, especially in summertime when we've got not as much fresh water flowing down from our creeks and, and a lot more salt water pushing up. The salt water pushes up and up through the year. So in winter time, right now we've, we've got floods going on, but in not, it, when it's not flooding in winter, it would still be pretty much fully fresh in Launceston. But in summertime, we're, we're getting up around 15,000 um, cubic. 15,000 cubic? Cu <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Sorry, um, the salinity is around 15,000 okay. in one system, uh, which is yeah. ha halfway, to, halfway to marine. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. sort of halfway uh, to oceanic. Mm. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so we, we'll just flash up the uh, health report card that was recently uh, generated by the Tamer Estuary and S Rivers program. These guys uh, uh, regularly produce this report card and try to monitor how the health of our waterway is going. And you can see here there are five zones, Launceston being zone one, out to zone five uh, at the heads. And down the right hand side, you've got the relative score. Let's start out at the um, heads there. It looks like the lower estuary is very healthy. Uh, and part of that is because of the good flushing that we're getting from those um, yeah. Bass Strait waters coming in and going out quite regularly. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that water has a high dissolved oxygen content. So there's plenty of oxygen for the marine life. There's uh, no not much sediment load in the water. The water's beautiful and clean, yeah. um, which we can see when we go for a snorkel down there or a swim at the beach. The yeah. water's beautiful and clear. And not too many nutrients, just, just sort of the right amount of nutrients for yep. an estuary. Yep, and we'll have a look at what those nutrients feed mm. in the moment. Then you've got the middle section, zone three and down to zone two there, and they're still relatively healthy at, at B. Mm. Uh, did you want to say anything about that, why they get a slightly lower score? So they get a slightly lower score in this. In this report card, a lot of that B score was actually driven by if you can believe it, the 2016 floods. So when the June 2016 flood flowed through, it mobilised a lot of sediment from the upper estuary and, and the catchment. And when we have high sediment loads in water, it, it impacts all of the other water quality parameters. So nutrients go up, dissolved oxygen goes down. Yeah. Um, and though because of that asymmetrical tide that we were talking about before where um, contaminants get trapped in the upper portion of the estuary, that the effect of that flood lingered mm -hmm. for years yeah. and we could see it for, for several years in the data after, after the flood. So those B grades are, are a lot to do with those lower dissolved oxygen and high nutrient values. Uh, while we're just talking about those nutrients and lower down the estuary, not all nutrients are bad though. No, well, nutrients are completely necessary. Yeah. For, for an, an estuary, and one of the reasons why estuaries are such highly productive places is because of the nutrients that are captured in those systems, and that then feeds the phytoplankton and the wetland plants, which then start off that food web. Yeah, so under normal uh, circumstances, mm -hmm. uh, the estuary would be ticking along, receiving natural nutrient yep. loads, uh, natural sediments. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, well, let's now look at zone one, which mm. is on system, and it, it fails. It fails, and it fails on a number of fronts. It fails very much on um, that sediment load. Uh, even though the upper estuary is a, is a turbid, it's a turbidity maximum, so we expect high turbidity, high suspended sediment load in the water. It's higher even than it should be for the upper estuary, um, and that's really an indication of human impact. Mm. Um, we have a lot, we have a large catchment for this estuary. It's 15% of the state flows down into Launceston through the north and southeast rivers. We, we know those two because they're the two named rivers, but also it takes all of the meander catchment that comes in there. Yeah. Quite a lot of the, you know, the Macquarie catchment flows into that as well. So a large portion of the state flows into Launceston. We have 
catchment impacts, so um, when we have agricultural runoff, road runoff in the, in the catchments, yep. that all comes down through, but also all the things that run off the streets and building sites in Launceston all end up in that upper estuary. And again, they get trapped and flushing backwards and forwards and they can't get out. So we end up with a concentration of contaminants yep. in that upper estuary. And so should we mention the elephant in the room now, which is the combined system? The combined system? We can, we can talk well, just, about the combined just system. with the D, we'll get it out of the way. We'll get it out of the way. So um, Launceston has a combined stormwater and sewage network, old Launceston built in the 1860s, um, copying what was going on in, in Northern Europe. and It was cutting edge at the time. Cutting edge at the time. It could have gone either way as a separated system or a, or a combined system. Um, Paris, London and New York all have combined systems um, and they were put in as, you know, as a response to the cholera epidemics and those sorts of things, getting the water away. Um, combined systems work really well in that when it rains a little bit, all of the first flush of stormwater that's got all the cigarette butts and, and chip packets in it and, and dog poo that's mm -hmm. sitting on the footpaths, yeah. all of that goes into the sewage treatment plan and gets treated. Right. So that the worst of the contaminated stormwater gets treated in a combined system. But once the system is, there's too much rainwater, then we have all the water still going to the sewage treatment plant, but the excess water that it can't take will overflow into the estuary. And that's where we get a combination of mostly cleaner stormwater, but also some raw sewage into the into the estuary. Um, but those those overflow events don't contribute to it. Can, don't contribute any solids. I think that's perhaps a misconception mm. yeah. about our system. Um, they, all those pump stations are all screened, so they catch all the dirt mm. and then. Cigarette butts. So we're just talking first. high nutrient loads. We're just talking so high nutrient load water. Yeah. All right. Uh, so just to lead me into the next slide, is this sedimentation issue isolated to Launceston? Yes or no? No. No. Yeah, it seems to be a real community wide problem or, or it's this, this thing that people are really worried about. Mm -hmm. so they see it as pollution and an eyesore. Yes. yes. Well, Here's a, I just grabbed this photo from the exhibition Estuary Below the Surface on my phone just half an hour ago, just so you can, so excuse the quality of the photo, but it shows the different subtitle habitats and the, the orangey brown colour extends from Launceston right through to uh, Beauty Point. 60% of the subtitle habitats in the estuary are sediments. Yeah. Uh, that's typical of an estuary. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Estuaries naturally want to infill with sediments. Yes. Yeah. And that and that this system has been infilling for six thousand years. Mm -hmm. um, it is it is the normal normal way for these sort. It's a drowned river valley that will slowly fill in over time. We can see parts of the North Est have already essentially achieved that, where we have our big meanders through the yeah. North Est, the big M shape around um, Glebe Farm, yep. right in the middle of town. Um, so this system is wanting to fill itself in. And, and, and if we left it alone for the next 300 years, mm -hmm. uh, we could end up with something that looks like an extension of the North Esk travelling down further than Launceston. Yes. A, a narrow, yep. winding, yep. deeper channel with it's a, a effectively a, a bit more of a river. A bit more of a, a river with those intertidal flats and, yeah. and floodplains extending out from there. Okay. Um, yeah. So completely, completely normal. Okay. So... So let's learn to love our sediments quickly. Those that might have joined me on uh, Tuesday might have seen this slide. Uh, sediments aren't dead. They're, they're living, uh, breathing habitats. The image in the top uh, left shows sediments down near Batman Bridge in about 16 metres. Uh, you can see the uh, sediments that have been uh, resuspended when I've um, fallen to the seabed. Uh, I've breathed, scuba, scuba gear bubbles have risen and just picked up all those soft sediments. So they are mobile sediments. Uh, we do want them to move uh, along the channel, but we don't want to inundate other uh, sort of habitat types. Now, in that image, there are a couple of living things. There's a browny, maroon coloured section, that in bottom right, and that is some type of algae. And the thing that's obvious in the middle of the image may be a sponge, 
maybe not, maybe an maybe ossidian, a siphon. maybe a siphon. A um, clam that lives in the, in the benthic sediments. Yeah, it may be alien. We don't know. Because, <laughs> Probably not. No. But uh, what, I couldn't collect that uh, because of uh, the conditions. Once I'd taken the photo, it disappeared and I had to go to the surface because I couldn't see anything. But what, what's there is an image showing you that there are things living in it and things living on it. So mm. sediments aren't dead. No, they're not. No. And if you leave them alone long enough, you'll get things like you know, you've got the uh, egret there. Um, it's fishing. Uh, so when the water comes up over the soft sediments, uh, fish move in to feed on those soft sediments, and then you've got higher order organisms benefiting from that. And also, if you leave them alone long enough, you'll end up with wetlands. And so you've got a mother and uh, chick there, moorhen, uh, bullcoot. So that's that's common to, along uh, soft sediment habitats and mudflats. So yeah, one of the oh, you can stay on that on the slide. One, one of the I'm things that we notice about our um, a lot of our wetland birds, intertidal birds, is they have really long beaks. Hmm. And they have really long beaks so that they can poke their beaks down into the sediment to get all the th to get their lunch, yeah. to get all of the things that are living in those sediments. Which might be mollusks, yeah. uh, crustaceans, yeah. Yeah, worms. worms. Yeah. All right, so, we'll, so that's my photography. But then we're very fortunate that in Launceston we've got a young photographer, St John Pounds, SJ Photography. He's uh, kindly lent me these photos. <laughs> It shows you what mudflats can look like mm. if you leave them alone. Mm. So they're, they're quite rich in biodiversity. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, it's, I find it ironic that uh, if you leave uh, Riverside and get to L Lagana here on the estuary, you've got a, a wetlands that is celebrated. Yes. Uh, people travel there to do this kind of photography to see the wildlife. Yep, it's, it's protected by uh, international conventions. That, that site, it has uh, birds from all over the world come to Tamar Island wetlands. Uh, we could have that in the city. Yeah, there's not a hard boundary there. There's no so, hard boundary. No, so. and, and I've been down to down to the Forter and Launceston on a still evening at a low tide and seen 10 species yeah. of waterfowl. There you go. So they will yeah. use it. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. And, uh, of course, they're the, the uh, mud flats. And then here is what you can have in terms of a wetland. And uh, wetlands are, are extremely important. They filter the water, yep. collecting a lot of the pollutants that we produce. Absolutely. Yeah. And we've yep. already stated that they're good habitats for a range of animals. Yeah. And we use wetlands as treatment for in water quality mm. treatment plants. Yeah. So you're so, using natural systems yep, using as opposed to industrial uh, or uh, engineering systems. Yeah. Well, they're bi essentially constructed wetlands are bioengineering. Yeah, great. And they're used so sewage treatment plants with right. fantastic filters. So with this image, uh, the plant in the foreground is Phragmites, which is a, a, a native uh, wetland plant. Unfortunately for our estuary, we've got rice grass introduced. Mm -hmm. um, do you know when that was introduced and why? It was introduced in the 1940s, and that was partly to act as a sediment trap. Yeah. yeah. So it was it was a, an, an effort to create wetlands mm. in the middle estuary that would uh, trap the sediments to try and uh, keep waters open yeah, so further up estuary. That's the other, that's so the way I heard it. Same thing, but from a different angle is introduce it so it builds up those. Um, Shores, mm -hmm. and then the same 300 million, 300 million cubic meters of water each day has to go through a narrower channel, yes. and so it scours and yeah. it keeps the channel open yeah. for shipping. Yeah, we'll come back to shipping. We will. All right. So down at the uh, heads of the estuary, it is a biodiversity hotspot. Uh, who knew? Yeah. Who knew? Amazing. Yeah. Uh, so in the top. Left there, you've got uh, dense algal beds. Uh, top right, you've got uh, giant kelp forests. Uh, very important habitats, mm -hmm. particularly for uh, things like uh, small mollusks that live on uh, algal plants. You corrected me on this recently. It's um, you know that is a, a habitat for some of the smaller shells that uh, when they die, they'll wash onto shore and uh, 
they've been used in cultural practices for Indigenous yeah. shell making and such. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, most of our kelp in Tasmania is gone, probably linked to climate change. Mm. Critically endangered habitat yeah. Yeah, under the federal legislation. Yeah. Mm. And we've got some right here? We're right, very lucky to have it at the heads. And then below that, you've got... Uh, so, so in the estuary, around the 17 metre water depth, there's just not enough light to support photosynthesis. And so the plants don't dominate. It's all the animals, the invertebrates. And so there you've got in the foreground a uh, soft coral, uh, Zimmer's sea fan. And all around it, there's not a piece of rock to be seen. Everything there is some type of living organism competing with each other. And you've got fish swimming through it as well. Mm. What's interesting there is there's two rocks uh, the way they're formed, a current will be rushing through there. These animals can't move to get their food. They're relying on the food coming to them. And so the strong currents created by that tide mm -hmm. feed these animals. And then if you go out a little bit further outside the heads into about 24 metres, you get these just magnificent, vibrantly coloured, uh, sponge-dominated assemblages. Mm -hmm. the, now, we're in 24 metres there. But there are some algae in the foreground. There's a red, um, some red algae and some green algae. And the, the reason that they can survive there is that the water is much clearer mm. and the light can penetrate mm. further. So, however, where you get towards Launceston, you've got more turbidity, mm. less light mm -hmm. penetration, so you just don't get the algae growing. You just don't get them. All right. No. Okay, so from Launceston through to the heads, you've got a very diverse, different natural system yep. with... What a range of habitats yep. and inhabitants. Yep, that's right. right. And and we tend to think of it as one system. We give it one name. It, um, it's one system, but actually, it's not really one system. As you said, we've got the wetlands, and then we've got that brackish water in the middle, and then we've got these beautiful marine waters yep. um, down at the heads. And if we flip to the next side, yeah. this slide, we can see that. For thousands of years, the first Tasmanians understood the system in that way. Yeah. So uh, their name for the lower estuary, the, the marine section was the pond rabble, and further upstream you have the Kanamaluka. Yeah. So separating it into those two very distinct ecosystems and, and knowing, understanding the landscape in that way. And knowing that with the seasons, you know, there's no firm line. You don't yeah. step over some line to pond rabble. That, That's right. that moves with the seasons. Yeah. Uh, so we, we've ex, um, we've taken on the Kanamaluka aspect of the name mm -hmm. in the Gazette. We, it is now Kanamaluka. It's still River Tamer. It's yes. something we have to change because yeah. it's not river. It's, it's not a river. Stuff. And we don't want you to call it a river. No, no, it is an estuary. So there you go. We, um, we know that the um, Kanamaluka Tamer estuary has been used by the first Tasmanians mm -hmm. for around 40,000 years. There's artefacts on along the length of it. Mm. And, and you can kind of see it, it, in the same way that we use the system in the, mod, in the modern day, it is the, is it a meeting place? Mm -hmm. You can see there are three sort of three clan Clans. groups, yeah. three family groups, and they all meet in this one place. It, it is such a productive system yeah. and it's a natural meeting place, yeah. a natural um, human population centre. Yeah. And along the length of it, uh, there uh, is evidence of the different foods they might have eaten at mm. uh, particular seasons. For instance, up at uh, Beauty Point in the West Arm, there's um, shellfish, mm. uh, middens there. Mm. Uh, yeah, so, and, and of course, down further on, they would have been hunting more uh, macropods, the wallabies, mm. uh, around the um, more swampy areas. Okay. So let's jump forward to European history. Mm -hmm. This is a map that we, we do giggle at this because um, the sedimentation is not a new issue. It's this not. is this is 1833, just just around 30 years after the first Europeans arrived. Mm -hmm. And do you why don't you talk us through? Sure. Well, what we understand as the as the upper estuary around Monsesta now, um, we have a generation of people who remember it as being a deep water port. But if we look, we don't have to look very hard at all through the historical record to to find out that it was always, it always looked very similar to how it looks now. Patterson ran aground at low tide, just trying to get here the first time. Yep. Didn't, couldn't get all the way up into what is now Launceston. The mud flats with the channel 
uh, in between the high velocity water and the, the intertidal swamps, it was all laid out in just the same way. Uh, because Launceston was a major city for, for Tasmania for a long time and an export city, and we didn't have roads, we relied on that 70 kilometres of waterway to move our, um, move our imports and exports. And so we were bringing ships into Launceston. And as our ships got bigger, especially after the Second World War, we got containerised um, cargo ships, that they needed more water. And so we started a dredging program, started dredging probably in the late 1890s up until the late 1960s when finally the highways were built, the Bell Bay port was established and all the port facilities moved downstream. Yeah. So in the so 60s when... Bell Bay's open, there's just not the need to get those large ships into Launceston. That's right. And so then the there's not that stopped. economic need yeah. to to keep modifying the waterway. That's right. And there's no if there's no economic driver for dredging, um, we there's no need to dredge. Dredging is incredibly expensive. Yeah. Um, it, at its height, we were moving on average 160,000 cubic metres of sediment out of the estuary every year. Um, and for all of that sediment that we have moved, picked up out of the estuary and moved, it is today pretty much yeah, so. how it was. So I don't know how well you can see that, but that's, a, that's an aerial photo from 2016. Um, and you can see you've got the North Est coming in and meeting up with the South Est that's flowing through and the mud flats in a very similar place to where they are now. We've infilled Royal Park. Um, and, and really moved the, the mouth of the northwest, the confluence with the Tamar um, north a little bit. We've, we've certainly filled in most of our swamps around on the system, but in essence, it's the same. Mm. And so um, nature will all, the system, yeah. the, the salinity and the clays will always bring us back to this point where we have mud flats and channels. Yeah. All have, right. Do you want to, I'm just conscious of time. Yes. Did you want to quickly run us through some... Some of the management, your favourite mm. management methods. Well, this one's Hunter's Cut. So there, there have been lots of management options to try and fix the problem of the sediment in Launceston. Perceived problem. Okay. Fix the problem. Uh, that's right, perceived problem, but it is a perception issue. Um, we've had dredging. We've just talked a bit about dredging. Hunter's Cut was um, an engineer in the 1900s, came to Tasmania, from the UK and suggested that perhaps if we could straighten the Tamar a little bit, mm. we could get the water out more quickly. Um, we would be able to get past some of those asymmetrical tide issues. So this is Hunter's Cut through Riverside where they tried to cut Stephen, cut a channel through Stevenson's Bend and straighten the estuary. We've also have, um, we have barges buried at mm -hmm. Tamar Island yeah. um, to try and act as sediment traps. We've got the the rice grass that we were talking about before yes. acting as sediment traps. And then we have um, other ideas. The Hunter's Cut failed, by the way. It, it didn't stay open for any length of time, no matter how much digging they did. It just filled straight back in again, very similar to the Lord of Our Canal yeah. in Hobart. So there's one that really stands out for me, and that is there's um, the ongoing um, requests to turn part of the Tamar into a freshwater lake. Mm. Yeah, and that, that, that comes up often. That, that idea's been discussed for potentially around about 80 years, I think, off and on at different locations, um, turning the North Esk into a, so putting a weir at the North Esk confluence. Um, Freshwater Point at Lagana, there's one that was proposed for all the way down at Rose, um, Rowella. Mm. So turning two thirds of the estuary into a freshwater lake. And as well as being incredibly expensive to build and um, environmentally destructive because you will be turning uh, an, an, an estuary, totally estuary into a freshwater system yeah. um, and, and really trapping those contaminants from the urban area in that lake where you'll have terrible water quality. Um, all you will be doing with the sediment problem is transferring it to the next population downstream. So if we put, if we put a, a lake a, a weir wall or a, or a dam wall at Lagana, rose views will inherit yes. our sedimentation problem. So they will lose their open water channels and the marina that's being proposed for rose views will then be mm. uh, 
an idea not worth pursuing because they will have the mud flats that we have here in one system. The so, system won't change. No. Um, one of the other side effects of turning it into a freshwater lake is depending on where you put it down, Esther, if you put it down at Rowella, it will actually start to act like a sediment sink and you will start to steal the sand from Five Mile Bluff and Greens Beach and all that, all those sands will get sucked in to the vacuum and we will end up with sandier mudflats at Rowella and rocky foreshore at Greens Beach and Five Mile Bluff and completely change those ecosystems and property values. And even in the lake, though, it wouldn't be this lovely magical blue lake. It would, not. It would be an extension of the um, Trevallon Dam, which uh, sometimes has blue-green algae problems. I mean, yes. it's going to be a turbid waterway. Yes. Uh, you won't have a lovely trout fishery because no. you'll have a lot of invasive species like tench, redfin, yeah. perch, yeah. gambusia. Yeah. They will just take over. Yeah. And also in the interim, maybe, what, 10 years, there will just be a cesspit of oh. dying marshlands. Yeah. Uh, it's... Yeah, and, and re release of all of those um, sediments that have bound up a lot of heavy metals. So yeah, that's it right. is it isn't it isn't an ecologically sensible solution. Or economically mm -hmm. or socially. Um, and we only have to look to if we want a local example, we look at Oriolton Lagoon down at um, down at Sorel, mm -hmm. where they tried to turn that system into a little freshwater lake and they've now had to put in Pipes to try and get flushing back in there because it just turned into a stinky mess. And that wasn't even in a population centre. Barrages and dams on estuaries are being taken out around the world. Yeah. Um, and yet we're having, still having a discussion here about putting them in. And so um, I'm just conscious of time that um, it's not about fixing a, a part of the estuary. It's the estuary as a whole system and it needs to be considered as a whole estuary. You can't absolutely. fix one part no. because you'll be doing something wrong. That's right. Part. Every, everything has a flow on effect. All right. So we might just, um, what if we don't uh, try to make nature do what we want, mm -hmm. maybe nature can work for us. Nature will totally work for us. Do you want to talk us about through some flood numbers? Sure. So uh, as I was talking before, it's a huge catchment. Um, the South West River starts over near the east coast. It starts almost at Scamander. Mm -hmm. um, we have, so it's a huge catchment. And when it rains at grey, all of that water, when we get those 150 mils overnight at grey, all that water gets to us two and a half days later. Um, so Launceston is a flood-prone city, and there you can see uh, the water thundering down through Cataract Gorge through those dollarite cliffs. Um, we could spend a million dollars dredging 20,000 cubic metres out of the estuary to try and get a bit of a navigation channel through there. Yeah. Um, a medium-sized flood of 1,000 cubic coming through Cataract Gorge will take three times that amount of sediment away. Um, the system will do it for us if we're prepared to work. So you mentioned the 1,000 cumex. That's not a number that most people would understand. But can I flash up today's flood data? And yeah. Maybe you can talk, yeah. talk. This is live. This is live data. So this is um, a cumex is a cubic metre of water per second. So 1,000 cubic metres of water per second mm -hmm. run through there. That photo you had before was the 2016 flood, which yeah. was 2,500 cubic oh, sure. metres per second. Yeah coming down through Carrot Gorge. Um, we had rain in Grey and on the on the east coast this week, and that water has now hit Launceston, and we've got uh, 300, what is it, 300 cumex, cumex going over Trevallon Dam at the moment. Yeah. We need 150 cumex going over the dam to induce scour mm -hmm. in the estuary. We've got a, a critical shear velocity, and that's at 150 cumex. At the moment, we've got 300. So... South Esk is doing it for us. Mm. We don't need to dredge because the system will do it itself if we let it. When, I, when we were uh, breaking, it became clear pretty quickly that the sediments weren't going anywhere. They That's were right. returning on those that asymmetrical tide yep. and effectively pushing it straight back up here. So That's we, right. we were fighting nature, funny enough. Yes. In this scenario... Mm -hmm. How far might nature push some of those sediments? Um, 300, 300 cumex is probably not enough to get it all the way down and out, um, all of that, 
all of that sediment, it'll probably make it, a lot of it will make it down to mid estuary and then it might get trapped in those, yep. um, trapped nice. in those rice grasses and marshes. Um, some of it will make its way back up estuary. That is the nature of this system is for the upper estuary to be trying to find that balance of water and sediment. Um, some of it will make it all the way down and out and feed those sponge gardens that, yeah. Are, yeah. that are down the other end. All right. Uh, I think we're nearly at the end. So have you got any no, closing yes. remarks? Um, I think that what I would love is for people to remember or understand that the estuary is all of it. It's the 70 kilometres that goes all the way to the sea. It's not... Um, it, it, it's a beautiful thing and the wetlands have their value and the sponge gardens have their value, but it's and it's all connected. And anything that we do up here in Launceston is connected to what happens to the length of it. It's a, it's a beautiful yep. system. We're incredibly lucky yeah, we are. to live here. And uh, for me, this, this photo from SJ Photography sums it up. Learn to love your wetlands. Learn to love mm -hmm. your mudflats. They are a natural part of... It's part of the reason that uh, the Tasmanian Aboriginals use the area. It's part of the reason that the Europeans settled here. It's a, a great place to be. Stop fighting nature. Yeah. Let nature turn this into it. Yeah. All right. Well, I thank you, Catherine. I, I think we'll end there. Uh, we'll just jump over to uh, see if we've got any questions. Need these. Really enjoy the event. Thank you, Shirley. What if, uh, Neil asks, what effect does the diversion of rivers through the hydro have on sediment, Catherine? Sure. So there is certainly a, a feeling in the community that the diversion of fresh water through Trevallon Dam has made a, a difference to, to the estuary. Um, some of that is true. At the moment, on under normal conditions, there's about 20 kilometres of water goes through Trevallon Power Station. Today there'll be more like 90 mm -hmm. going through because they'll be uh, generating as much power as they possibly can out of that system. When the when Trevallon Dam went in, it went in at a very similar time to when we stopped dredging. So there is a um, it is more like a coincidence rather than a causation that. The hydro dam went in at the same time as the mudflats mm -hmm. formed. Um, it definitely has some impact if we had those 20 kilometres of water coming down through the cataract board instead of going through Talras, you would have 20 kilometres of volume more in that channel. But that's not, not a great deal of space. It's never had deep water in Launceston. Um, it's always been mudflats with a shallow channel. As in 1833. As, as in 1833. And the, the other thing to remember is that what what the Trevallon Dam gives us as a community is a, is a first basin that we can swim in pretty much all year round with consistent flow. In summertime, we still have two and a half kilometres of water coming through there, which keeps it flushed and keeps it at the same level. If we didn't have the dam, we would have low flow in summer and we would have more problems with algal blooms and the water quality would not be as good as it is because we've got extra water coming through. We do actually get 30% of water that goes through Trevallon Dam is diverted from the Great Lakes and diverted down through Poatina and then into the southeast. So that's water that would normally have that's come water. down that system. That's water here. that normally would have flowed south. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, I don't have any other questions. If you're out there, give us a question. But one one for me was we, we've talked about the tide coming up to Launceston, but how much further do, is it tidal mm. than just Launceston? It goes all the way to St Leonard's. Oh. Yeah, so we can we can see the tide pushing up all the way to St Leonard's. So if you're if you're walking along the North East River at Hobblers Bridge, you can see whether it's low tide or high tide because of how much river bank is exposed along the North Esk. So at St Leonard's there is a, a weir where the swimming hole is and that's the upper extent of that system. Um, and with that tide that pushes all the way upstream, we have 
um, diadromous fish like the Australian grayling that mm. lives part of its life in the sea and part of its life in the freshwater, and that migrates upstream. Mm. In fact, there's a number of fish that use the estuary. You've mm. got your, uh, uh, the Tasmanian uh, whitebait, yep. Lavetia celia, used to be in quite large numbers, but now, well, it's still out there, but uh, the one that we see a lot of now are your galaxid species, your native. You've got and your eels use it. Yeah, plenty um, of eels. Yeah, each year uh, eels migrating downstream because they want to get out to the coral sea to mm. breed. Mm. So, uh, I've got one other question there. We talked about the combined system and what feeds in. Mm -hmm. What what at a individual household level can be done to reduce impacts on water quality in the estuary? Uh, a lot. Actually, if you uh, if you are building a house in Launceston, if you could make sure that your building site has sediment and erosion controls on it to stop the sediment from running off your building site and into the stormwater network, that will have a huge impact. Launceston has 1% of the land area of the catchment and accounts for about 18% of the sediment that hits the system. So much of that comes off our construction sites and our gardens. So if we can stop that, that's massive. Um, if you live outside the combined system in Launceston, so if you live outside central Launceston, Invermay, parts of East Launceston, you're in a separated stormwater network. So anything that you put down your stormwater pipe goes straight into a creek and straight into the rivers. Um, so if you're washing your paintbrushes in the garden and they're going into the stormwater tap, your creek will go the colour of your house. Um, so keeping contaminants out of the stormwater network is also a massive part of what we can do as a community. We get a lot of complaints about the amount of rubbish that's in our waterways. All of that rubbish is put there by someone who didn't put their rubbish in a place that it should have gone. Could have been responsible for your own actions. Yeah. Oh, let's check back here. Uh, no, I, but I do like, I've got a heap of we talked about engineering uh, wetlands. Mm. Uh, is there some way for Launceston to use that as a, a solution to some of the water problems? That, uh, yeah, absolutely. So we, we are looking at um, places where we might be able to do some foreshore remediation using um, natural fibres and uh, creating, letting some of those wetlands come back where our edges have been destabilised by, by dredging and raking and all those right. other sorts of things. Uh, wetlands around our fringes of our estuary are really great for protection from storm surge, really great for absorbing um, impact energy during during flood events, and also really great carbon sinks. So for, for a climate change mitigation but also um, resilience, foreshore wetlands are a really important piece of the puzzle for us as a city and for the estuary as a whole. So all of the residents down the down the estuary who live near the water will benefit from having more wetland along their fringe. We talked uh, a couple of days ago about the the benefits of salt marsh or, or blue blue carbon. Any blue of the carbon. Um, yeah. uh, intertidal zone subtidal yeah. vegetation that it does such a you know, important job in capture, recapturing carbon. Yeah, that's like right. Blue, much, blue much carbon can, accounts for 55% of all vegetation taking carbon. That's yeah, right. much, much higher than um, much higher than forests planting trees mm. and much quicker. Mm. It's really quick to get a, to get wetlands established and to have them capturing carbon straight off the bat. And we're also doing that in some of our urban waterways mm. in Launceston. We've got a project in Newnham at the moment behind Brooks High School where we've got a stormwater ditch essentially mm -hmm. through a park and we're now going through a process of remediating that, slowing the flow down, planting planting in it to create habitat, to trap those nutrients, to trap those sediments and, and, pollutants. To, and pollutants. They will absolutely break down pollutants mm -hmm. and um, capture, capture carbon. And it will be prettier. It will be a nicer thing to look mm -hmm. at in the park. Yeah. All right, well, uh, I'll just check if there's one, one last question. No, I think we're off the hook. Thank you, Catherine. Thank um, you. Now, don't forget to join uh, QB Mag again tomorrow at 10 o'clock when Martin George will be back 
and this time with Elise Alenda, and they'll be talking about the ExoMars 2022 mission to the Red Planet. Thanks, and join us again. Thanks. Thank you.